um, I hope that you enjoy this presentation tonight. Um, I know that reading um, Kevin's memoir, right, um, it really kind of gave me a deeper appreciation for, for just the humanity of, of the experience of identity formation. And, and I hope that some of that um, is, is also uh, passed on to you during this talk tonight. And with that, I'd like to turn over the floor um, to Kevin Barheit, if we can, um, as best we can on Zoom, make him feel welcome to Lewis University. Uh, Kevin, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, John. And uh, many thanks to Lewis University and to the Social Work Department and Social Work Association uh, for sponsoring me today for this Arts and Ideas event. It's a real honor to be with everyone here today. My name is Kevin Barheit. Before that, my name was Stephen Michael. And before you, before you even hear another word from me, uh, I want you to hear the words of the woman who named me Stephen. This is a uh, two-page letter, handwritten letter that I'm going to read from for you. Uh, it's a letter that was written by my biological mother and was to be given to my my adoptive mother, and it never was. And during the search for my family, I was able to uncover this letter, and I won't go into all the details of how that happened. It was a little, a little bit of a, an ordeal for me. Um, but as I read this, uh, I want you to realize this is the first, the first communication I ever had with my, with my, with my family. to Stephen Michael's mother. As you see, I've named your child after St. Stephen to give him courage and St. Michael to protect him. I know that you will probably want to give him another name along with your surname, but I will always think of him as Stephen Michael. I want you and your child to know that I am not an evil person. I did something very wrong, but I have and will continue to pay for it. I know that a great deal of good has come from my having Stephen, for I know that he will bring a great deal of happiness into your home. You will note that I do not refer to him as being my child. God has created him in my body, but you will make him into the kind of man that God wants him to be. Therefore, you are his mother, more than I have been. You are accepting a great task for which you will receive my eternal gratitude and prayers. I have loved your child very deeply through these past nine months, and it hurts me very deeply to give him up. But I know that you will love him as much as I do, and that you will be able to give him a normal and happy life. He will always have my love and my prayers as he has had in these past months. I will pray also for you and your husband that you will be able to raise your son in the light of God's graces. May God shed an abundance of his graces on both you and your husband forever. Thank you. It was unsigned. Let me clarify something. Magical or magic, what do I mean by that? My life currently is absolutely magical by any standards, but especially in contrast to my life before recovery. I work at Union College, have a master's in education. I have four beautiful children, three amazing grandsons, 36 years of sobriety and will soon be celebrating 27 years of marriage to the love of my life. Magical is possible. Even after addiction, even after child sexual abuse, and even after the abandonment and the wounds of adoption, we can find a path to healing. And that path can be full of joy and wonderment and peace. It's the path to healing that's magical. And the effort that we put forth with hope and ambition, that's magical. 
But magic, by definition, will never be real. And just like my mother, who loved me, wanted more than anything to believe that relinquishing me would give me, in her words, a normal and happy life. For the general public, it's extremely likely, likely they know very little about adoption and that what they do know is probably highly curated. It's feel good stuff. And in the US, we have largely wiped away the traumatic part of the story of a mother being separated from her child and the child being separated from everyone and anyone they were ever related to. I was baptized when I was a year old as Kevin John Barhite, but before that, my baptismal name was Stephen Michael Wagaspak. Great, great Cajun name. Every day I speak to people and tell a story by way of introduction. Mostly the story is that my name is Kevin. I'm the husband of a wonderful woman from Kumamoto, Japan. Or my story is Kevin. I work at Union College in Schenectady, New York. Another story is I'm Kevin. My son Tyler is an entrepreneur. His brother Kentaro is a PhD student. That's, that's my quick and easy day-to-day -day story. Then there's this other story. My name is Kevin. I am a person who never knew his family of origin. I'm Kevin. I'm a child sexual abuse survivor. My name is Kevin. I'm a recovering addict. When I considered the way that I, I might share my thoughts with you today, I kept returning in my mind to the act of healing, which for me has often meant storytelling. So please try to think of what you're hearing today, maybe like more of an interactive audio book. The table of contents will guide you through the chapters of some of my thoughts. Before we open the book and read through together, I want to share one or two thoughts to set a through line for all of us. Almost a year ago, long before I thought about this topic of magical or magic, I was grieving a friend of mine. Nancy was in her 70s and died on a ventilator. She was unable to capture enough oxygen to stay alive. And I mourned her terribly. I had posted a note on Facebook and many people replied, my condolences and sorry for the loss. And I knew they were all very kind. And I, and I also knew that they all, like most of us, they really didn't know what to say. They had no words to suffice. Then one person posted four words that changed everything for me in that moment and since. I sit with you. Just four words, nothing else. And I cried without stopping and I curled up in a ball. I had no idea why those words meant so much to me. That's what I'm going to try to convey to you today. I sit with you will be our through line for the next hour or so. And that's what I'm asking of you. Please sit with me. On my YouTube channel, there are a series of episodes that the viewer gets to see and hear not only from what's known as Big Kevin, me, but also the little child within, the little Kevin that lived through the abandonment, abuse and addiction. And today, for the first time live, I'd like to introduce you to, uh, to little Kevin. So we're going to try this with the technology that we have. And if you wouldn't mind, let me just adjust my camera for you here. There we go. I think that since you've had a chance to listen to me, maybe it might be a good time to hear from this fella. Hmm. 
Yeah, it's fun to be here, and I'm glad that we are spending time together with you. Hi. No, I'm Kevin. Tell them about Kevin. I, I can. Should I? Yeah. Everything? Sure. Hi, my name's Kevin, and my name is Kevin John. John, Kevin John, bar height. And I would like to let you know a little bit about me and a little bit about me that you may know already because you know you might have heard a little bit about me as I was born when I was really little. And when I was really little, my mom couldn't take care of me. And because she couldn't take care of me, um, two other people took care of me. And that was my mom too. And uh, that's my mom and my dad. And they really loved me a lot. They did. And they wanted to take care of me. Um, and they told me that they, that my mom couldn't take care of me because she couldn't take care of me. So she uh, gave me away and that they loved me so that they, 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 they took me. <laughs> and that was really good. They told me because they loved me. And even though I was born uh, the way I think my mom always said it was, uh, you came from your mommy's tummy, but we love you. So we adopted you. So you came from our heart. <laughs> So I thought that I always came out of her heart. It was kind of funny. Um, but I didn't know what it meant. Tummy or heart is just like stuff, right? I have a tummy. Tummy here. Tummy, tummy's here. And I have a heart. And my heart told me that that was okay because my mom told me that that was okay, that my mom didn't take care of me or couldn't take care of me, so she gave me away. And I think I didn't understand that the pieces that were kind of crossing, crossing in, in like cross-eyed, <laughs> but crossing in my head were kind of, um, if my mommy couldn't take care of me, but she loved me so much that she gave me away, that my mommy and daddy adopted me because they loved me so much. So if my mommy loved me and gave me away, then my mommy and daddy who loved me were going to give me away sometimes. And they did. Mom and dad loved us, but they didn't know how to help. Yeah, they, they did, right. Um, they didn't um, know what to do because uh, I was really, really scared, I guess, when I was n nine. And um, this, this man did so something. And I didn't know what it was, so I just thought it was just fun and because there was other boys there too and we were having fun and we thought it was kind of cute or silly or like we were we were big boys now and um, my mom and dad didn't know about that I don't think so or nobody talked about it and then then I started using um, beer when I was 11 and as I got older I, I did a lot of beer uh, and things got worse and my um, trouble started at school and my um, police said that they they had to put me in probation um, and then the probation officer said that because uh, I got in a fight when I was a little bit older I had to go to a foster home and my parents said that they loved me but um, that that was the best thing for me so I went in the foster home and that wasn't really nice <clears throat> And so I ran away from that foster home and then I went to another foster home and that wasn't nice either. That was really not nice. And I went to a group home called Wait House. Wait House was different, but I was, uh, I, 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 they wanted to help me, but I don't think I could hear the help. So, so my mommy and daddy uh, let me go again. And the uh, <clears throat> detention center said uh, that I, I could I could leave and, and go back home when I was 15. But I didn't really know what it was like to be home. It was like going and not knowing. It's like going back to a to a place where you were you were from, but you don't know the language anymore. So it's kind of like I didn't know how to talk. So I left again. And I, I, I did a lot of stuff. Um, but the hard part was um, inside, um, here, and, and, and really down here, where I felt 
um, sad, a lot, and sick, a lot, and scared all the time. Um, I, I'm still scared telling you about it a little bit, um, but I know I don't have to be. So uh, I, I'm trying to just say, when I got people that talked to me and cared about me and, and loved me, um, that seemed to really help. At Wade House, there was a man named Father Ralph and Jane McCarthy was a therapist. And even my probation officer, when he told me that I had to go to the foster home, he was still still trying to, to, to show me that he cared. And all those people really helped, I think, um, even though I was still hurting and I was still scared and I still was really, really sad. Um, something inside me said, maybe, maybe, maybe it's going to be okay. But, but it was a long time before it was okay, right? That's right, it was. It was a long time before it was okay. Yeah. It's okay now. It's more okay. <laughs> it's more okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Say goodbye. Bye. Bye. We, we just heard from little Kevin and the many interwoven traumas that he articulated these traumas can be hard to identify, both for the trauma victim and their support system. And these traumas are often triggering beyond endurance. Dr. Sam Himmelstein, he's the founder and the CEO of the Center for Adolescent Studies. He talks about this triggered state and his intervention therapy. Himmelstein says, calming youth down into the window of tolerance so they can be receptive to other interventions is what I like to call an INCRA, inherently non-clinical relational activity. This, this window of tolerance is what we could get a glimpse of with little Kevin. It's an internal somatic state where the nervous system is activated but bearable for the individual. And, and these non-clinical activities can be things like taking a walk, throwing a basketball, dancing, singing, eating together. It's all about fostering relationships so that trust exists and disclosure is possible. Little Kevin was hurting, but talking. Little Kevin was remembering, not reliving the trauma. Trauma can be interwoven and trauma-informed care needs to be interwoven too. And that's where the inherently non-clinical relational activity comes into play. It includes both clinical and the subjective. As a survivor, I find great value in both. And I am better able to heal in an environment that accepts and nurtures both parts. So what could have helped me? Little Kevin talked about some people that were in his life. During the time in foster care and in a group home and detention center, there were some people who seemed to get me and who had an ability to practice that inherently non-clinical relational activity, even though that term didn't even exist. I'm going to read a short section, very short section of my book, and I want to introduce these people to you uh, and how they affected me. And I want to introduce this part of the book. I am uh, meeting with Father Ralph D. Pasquale. I'm around 14 years old. I've been taken out of my home. I went to a foster home and then another foster home. I ran away from both. I've run away three times from this second foster home and now I'm living above a bar and I steal at night and I sleep during the day, but I've run out of money. So I call my parents and I ask them to bring me some money and they say, well, we'll give you money, but get in the car and I won't get in the car because I think they're going to take me back to the foster home and they promise they won't and they won't take me back to the police. 
And so I get in the car and they drive me to their church. They bring me into the rectory and I meet with this man I've never met before, Father Ralph. And we sit and we eat, we eat lunch, we smoke, he gives me a cigarette. We don't even talk until now. And that's the part that I'm going to read for you. Father Ralph says, you're a good kid. I can tell and you've got nice parents, but they don't have any fucking idea how to control you, do they? Do they? With every sentence, he notches up the volume. I jump when he slaps his palm on the kitchen table. Do they? He screams in my face. What's your plan, huh? What's your plan? I want to hit him, slam my fist against his nose and run out the door. Fuck the money. Fuck my parents. Fuck everybody. He laughs, looks right through me, and I hate him all the more. Have another cigarette, Kevin. You want one before you go. You're going to go now, right? Right. I take the cigarette and light it, but something keeps me in my chair. Father Ralph leans forward again, puts his hand on my arm. You don't have a plan. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Do it your way and you'll get caught. You won't make it if you get caught and you're going to get caught. You're a good kid, but you're just a punk. That's plan A. He leans back in his chair and gives me an appraising look. Your parents are good people. They can't handle you, but they love you. Well, Father Ralph and I smoked a few more cigarettes and he got me to think about coming to stay at the group home. It was called Wait House, W-A-I-T-T. -T. We are all in this together. And I came there and it did change my life. Not, not right in the moment, but even to this day, I can tell you I am who I am in many ways in recovery because of that time there. And Father Ralph spent a lot of time with me, but he was a priest and he was busy with his, his business and he was also busy with other kids and other things at, at the group home. But he had hired a therapist, my counselor, Jane McCarthy, and Jane McCarthy played a role in my life that is just incredible. And in the book, she's actually the person that throughout my years, after I met her and for many years and into adulthood, I would call her. If I was in, if I was in jail, got arrested, I'd call her before I called my lawyer just to talk. She lived about 10 minutes away, 10 minute walk away from where my parents lived. And she invited me over when I was a kid. She invited me over. She said, if you ever want to come over, come over and have dinner with us. And I sat with her, Jane, and her husband, Emmett, and their children, Christopher and Brian. And I got to see how, a, how a, I guess, a normal family functioned. And I got to be with people that weren't, weren't thinking, what am I going to steal? What's he going to do wrong? When I met with her in this group home, she spent time with me. She thought about things with me, like telling me what my IQ was. No one had ever told me I had a high IQ. And she shared with me the books that she read and I talked about the books that I liked. And that person just grounded me in a sense of hope that I didn't even know and couldn't really grasp, but it stuck with me. There's one other person I wanna mention, it was Father Ralph and Jane, but there was Bernie Gerstner and little Kevin mentioned Bernie Gerstner, the probation officer. Even when I was in fights at school, even when I was getting in trouble, even when I was lying to him, even when he had to put me in a foster home or had to sentence me to the detention center, he still spent time with me. He still didn't ever seem to judge me. He actually was the guy who, I think because he was a younger probation officer, he did a group. And he invited me to be one of seven kids in a group. And I met these other boys that were just like me, using drugs, getting in trouble. And I don't remember a lot, but we would meet in those groups in the basement of a church. And to this day, I remember some of the things we did, not all of them. And I can tell you right now, I remember one distinctly. I got up on a chair and I had to close my eyes and fall backwards and trust that all these boys who were just as, just as nutty as me, 
would link their arms together and catch me. And they did. And I swear to you, I can feel that falling right now. And he took us away to a place called Bear Mountain. And we camped out for a weekend, just all of us. But there was one boy that didn't go, Craig. And that very weekend, we didn't even know it. He got, he was riding his bicycle with another kid and he got hit by a car and he died. And I remember I went to his funeral. I had to get stoned just to go in there, but I went it was a closed casket. And his mother was screaming and crying. Now, Father Ralph has passed away, but I got to thank him. I send a letter and I have the reply letter. Jane McCarthy has passed away, but I talked to her throughout the years and she died right before I, I published my book, but we talked about it. Bernie Gerstner is still alive and we're friends now. And we've had lunch many times now. And I remember I mentioned that funeral to him once. And you know, he said to me, I absolutely remember that, Kevin. I was so proud of you. And these are the kind of people that were in my life. These are the kind of people that made a difference right then and there. Father Ralph, Jane McCarthy, and Bernie Gerstner, I say their names with respect, and I, I say their names with reverence. They planted some seeds that later took root. They didn't judge me. They didn't shame. They didn't leave. More than anything, they sat with me. My wife is a social worker in our local community at the high school. And she told me this, the more preconceptions you carry into your work with clients, the less you will be able to hear. Father Ralph, Jane, Bernie, they could hear me. They could always, always hear me. As, as I've healed, I also had to look at the seeds that grew into the interwoven traumas of my life. They became one big trauma, it seems. And these were shame-based seeds. I was ostracized by the police, principals, my parents, CPS workers, teachers, parents of peers, definitely. And, and my peers themselves. By the time Father Ralph, Jane, and Bernie came into my life, I'd learned to believe the stories about myself, the stories that I was bad, that I was worthy of the hurt I felt, I was worthy of the shame. These three people, they had their jobs cut out for them, planting seeds with someone in as much pain as I was, as much pain as little Kevin was, was a monumental task. These seeds that they planted, what seeds do I think they were? They were the seeds of worth and of value. And it makes a difference. You make a difference. When you show up for someone the way they did, you make a difference. Some of you are here today and you may never know how profoundly you have helped someone. Father Ralph, Jane McCarthy, Bernie Gerstner, I was able to thank them all. That's rare and that's a miracle. These people cared. They wanted me to succeed. They showed me a path to hope and what it was like to be a part of a community. They were more focused on stopping the bleeding than fixing my past for them. And for me, helping people begins with improving human lives. It's the reason I wrote my book, the purpose of my YouTube channel, all the lectures or the interviews or the podcasts I do in the hope that it will help improve the life of others. The people who most greatly contributed to improving my life did so primarily by accepting me as I am treating me as someone who has human agency. You know, mapping the solar system of these interwoven traumas can feel like we're counting the stars during the daytime. It's hard. But it is possible to address these traumas. Father Ralph, Jane, and Bernie give us a map. To counter interwoven trauma, we can endeavor at least to provide trauma-informed care. 
And if compounding trauma can be measured and addressed, compounding healing can be pursued and achieved. For me, the trauma that seems to be all three, acute, common, complex, is my relinquishment by my first mother, that abandonment and subsequent adoption. For me, this is the primal wound that all other threads of interwoven traumas can be traced back to. And telling an adoptee not to feel the primal wound is like telling someone with allergies not to sneeze. It's a certain kind of grief. Some would label it as ambiguous grief, which in and of itself defies a timeline. And if as parents or social workers or therapists or priests or probation officers or principals or teachers, we find ourselves worn out and discouraged at our wits end, demoralized, hopeless, helpless, we can use those feelings, right? To help us get up even a shallow glimpse of the magnitude of how an adoptee might feel carrying that grief 24 hours a day. In an interview with Sunitha Pore, she's the author of The Good Night, Pore talked about grief and agency in a way that reminded me of that person on Facebook who, when my friend died, said simply, I sit with you. Puri said, eventually I realized that it wasn't my job to protect people from their grief or to solve it. I have learned to look when I want to look away. I have chosen to stay when I would prefer to run out of the room and cry. The prelude to compassion is the willingness to see. As an adoptee, when people ask me what they can do to help, what is it that I wish more than anything? This is what I wish they knew. This is the magical I'm looking for. This is my ideal. Sit with me. Stay. Sorry, folks, having a little technical difficulty here. We want the real to be the ideal, for reality to be the ideal reality, and the magic that we make is our effort to reach that ideal. Is adoption inhumane or is adoption magical? It's neither. But is adoption real or is it magic? An adoptee is real to the extent that I'm real. I exist. A first parent is real to the extent that a birth mother gives birth. An adoptive parent is real to the extent that they have assumed legal or moral possession. But adoption is nearly transfixing in its mutability. Adoption is magic in that it's simply an effort to reach a magical ideal. For me, as an adoptee, the magical was in the seeking. The ever-present effort to know who I am, all I ever wanted was a picture of my mother, just so I could know what she looked like around the time that I was born. I never felt I deserved anything more. And then it was a constant disassociative sense of who I was and where I came from. Is adoption magic? to the degree that I was denied the opportunity to fully understand my past, to know my ancestors, to fully define adoption as an adoptee? Is it manipulative sleight of hand through economic, social, familial, religious processes that seek to control the definition and image of adoption? Is there 
Is there magic in that effort? Is adoption sometimes emotional, self-centered hackery through the the rationalization justification of adoptive parents? Is that magic? Maybe. Maybe it's all of those things, in part or in whole as a byproduct of the effort to reach an ideal. For me, I guess those definitions are tangential at best. For me, the magical part of being adopted was the effort every single day to find a way to be me without knowing anything about where I came from. And that's why I searched for my family. John um, has volunteered to read something for me, um, and I'm going to ask him to do so at this time. This is, uh, I'll intro it very briefly. I, it's from my book. It's the section uh, I had been searching and searching, and I had come to so many dead ends, and I found a search angel that took me on, Pamela. And Pamela uh, helped me to finally find my, my biological mother, my first mom. Um, it's a very difficult piece for me to read, probably will be difficult to hear. It was definitely difficult to write, so I've asked John to read it for me and for you. Uh, this is the moment that uh, Pamela and I on the phone uh, talk, and she, she reveals to me uh, what she knows about my mother. John, if you would mind. Pamela took a long moment. I could feel my heart beating. Kevin, as I said, I've completed your search. I smiled and breathed, ready. I'm sorry to tell you, your mother has died. I sat perfectly still, not moving, not breathing, not thinking. I felt my mother slip away from me before I even know her name, the distance increasing as if I was being ripped in two from the top of my head in slow motion, each second a millennium. Despair settled on me as thick as gray ash and soot that blew over Brooklyn from Manhattan on that sky blue day in September. I held the phone and I cried while Pamela waited without words. Thank you, John. That was April 9th. On April 9th, 2007, I found my first mom. And unfortunately, I found a grave. When we search or choose not to search, there's no telling what we will find. The decision is always to search or not. And if we search, we will find something if we decide to search, no matter what we find, we will find out more about ourselves than we ever thought possible. After I found my mother, I also found that I had three siblings. And the first time I met my sister, Julie, was on the phone. <laughs> I was shaking to my soul. We had never spoken. I didn't even know if she knew I existed. There are only a few kinds of intensity that match that day in my life, and they include births and deaths. This phone call was not a physical life or death moment, but it was a time when I knew then and there, every single second that ticked away would change me forever. And it did. When I finally flew to Colorado to meet my siblings, I met my sister Julie first. And I, I, I rushed to her, I jumped out of the van that I was driving, put the, put the van in park, threw the door open with the engine still running, and I just fell out of the van and I grabbed her with all my might and I held her for dear life. And she cried and she laughed she says, I'm real. I'm really real. It's just so unbelievable. We finally took a, a half step back and we we're still holding each other, but we we're seeing each other for the very first time. 
and her eyes just got bigger and bigger. And she turned her face away and looked away from me. She said, I can't look at you. Oh my God, I can't look at you. Now, I'm overwhelmed and confused. I'm not hurt. I'm just, I just don't understand. And she won't look at me. But through her tears, she sobs and she says, you have her eyes. You have mom's eyes. All these years I've been looking for her, <laughs> waiting to see her to see her face, to look at her, and for her to see me. <laughs> Yet I have to be honest, somehow I, I had felt that she had been there with me throughout my whole life, somehow by my side. I know now that she was closer than ever. She was right there in me. She's always with me. She always sits with me. The wonderful, amazing silk artist, Lee Zimmerman, created this for me. He used, he used the words from my book, Dear Stephen Michael's Mother. I bled to write these words. I cried for her as if crying for God to be with me, to know someone who can never be known, someone who is known by their absolute absence. When, when you sit with me, this is what I want you to know. Before we go, let's, um, let's hear from little Kevin one last time. Okay. Is there something else you might want to share before, before we have to go tonight? Hmm? Okay, I kind of want to, yeah. Yeah, I kind of want to now. This is the fun part, right? This is the fun part. Hi, I wanted to tell you that the uh, um, bad stuff really was bad and hurt and it was scary. But, 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 but when, when the people that were really there for me and helped me uh, and cared about me and knew a little bit, I think, of, of how, how I was feeling and they just sat with me. Hmm. That made a difference, you know. I think that made a difference in not, maybe not in the time when I was there and I was really struggling and sad and scared. I don't know if I, I don't know if I really felt like it was going to be okay. But I didn't feel like it wasn't going to be not okay. I felt like sometime, maybe, someday, maybe, maybe tomorrow morning, <laughs> It might not be so bad. And now that I'm, I'm, I'm older and I'm bigger, I think the, 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 the okay is okay now. And the people that cared about me and, and did the, the, like the planting the seeds, the planting the seeds of kindness and, and love and helping me and caring about me, and not judging me and not shaming me, that really, that really helped when I was ready to change for myself. And when I changed for myself, I remembered, I remembered Jane McCarthy and Bernie Gerstner. And I remembered Father Ralph a lot because he really helped me because he believed in me and because he cared about me and because he loved me, but because he just sat with me. And Jane, she just sat with me. And Bernie sat with me too. I think sometimes he wanted to sit on me, but he just sat with me. And I think that when you help people, if you ever get to help people and you, you don't know if you're helping them at all, you don't know if you can really make a difference, please remember, just sit with me. Just sit with me a little. Don't go away, okay? I mean it. <laughs>
please don't go away. I'll remember that. And I'll remember that you were there. Maybe someday you won't even know, but I'll be able to tell somebody else, like a bunch of people on a computer, that you helped me because you just sat with me. And I'll be able to say thank you. Maybe you'll be able to, to, to think that next time if you ever get to help somebody. Because I feel like I got really, really scared. And sometimes I get really scared today. But maybe some of the people that you'll sit with who are really scared later, when they're really scared too, they'll remember that you sat with them and they'll feel like you're right there next to them. And maybe they'll just trust that long enough to try one more day. Can you, can you remember that? Just sit with me. Just sit with me. Thank you. So, so happy now. So happy now. Okay. 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 When, <clears throat> when I had my book launch event, the author, Diane Cameron, hosted and conducted interviews. My then 91-year-old adoptive mom, who you see on the screen, agreed to be interviewed. She was sitting in this chair right here in this room her room, which is where she lives with me and my family. And she, she talked with Diane, actually right on this computer. She smiled because <laughs> she bragged about me a little bit. What a beautiful baby I was, how smart and how cute I was. Then totally unprompted, she said these words. I don't know why they have that stigma of adoption. It's adoption of love. My husband and I were married 11 years and we just had a lot of love for another baby. She had a lot of love to give. That was her effort. That was her ideal. That was magical. And as she did while I searched for my first mother to only find a grave, my adoptive mom, she sat with me. And today I can share with you today publicly that last year, as I searched for and finally found my biological father, and again, I found a grave. Through it all, she sat with me and my wife, Ellie, sat with me and my sons and daughters and friends they all sat with me they could not heal my grief they couldn't even really truly rejoice in my discovery it's incomprehensible but they could sit with me they could stay that's not magic that's real and that for me is magical. I, I want to thank you all. I want to thank you for listening and for, for having me with you tonight. And yes, please, thank you so much. Thank you for sitting with me. John, I will turn this back over to you now. Thank you so much for your presentation.